On Tuesday, I got my blood tested for the first time in 2021. So what's my data? What's my biological age? So that's what we can see here, the nine variables and chronological age of Levine's uh, phenotypic age calculator, which is a measure of biological age. And based on these data, we can see that my phenotypic age, again, also known as biological age, is 32.6 years, which is 15.4 years younger than my chronological age of 48. Also note that this is my lowest biological age over 10 measurements since 2018, so uh, I'm on the right track. So let's compare these data against a few blood tests. So first, my previous blood test. How did these data compare with my last blood test? So my last blood test was in December of 2020, so just two months ago. And based on those data, my uh, biological age was 33.8 years. So I've improved in the two-month period since then. So also uh, interesting to note are, <clears throat> uh, well, I should also mention what, what was the major change. So what we can, what I've boxed is uh, I was able to reduce my C-reactive protein, which is a measure of uh, inflammation, by about 40%. And I'll get more into that in the upcoming slides uh, slides about what I think is driving those uh, that, that reduction. Uh, so how did these data compare year over year? So I also measured in March of 2020, and there may be seasonal effects uh, uh, to some of these data. So uh, how did the data compare year over year? So that data is here. This is uh, the second blood test that I did in 2020 uh, and from in March, and we're going to compare it against the uh, blood test that I just did earlier uh, on Tuesday. And we can see that my phenotypic age is 33.4 years. And uh, even though my chronological age went up by one year, my biological age was uh, reduced by uh, 0.8 years. So in the, right, on, on, in the right direction and on the right track. Also note that my C-reactive protein in that measurement was 0.37 milligrams per liter, whereas I, I was able to reduce it by about 30% for this just recent blood test. So the uh, obvious question should be, or I think is, what's my approach? How am I doing this? How am I able to maintain, uh, maintain this youthful biological age? So what's my fitness? What supplements am, am I taking? And what's my diet composition? So first, uh, in terms of average fitness stats, and for those who are interested in, uh, uh, I, I posted a picture on my uh, YouTube community page, a uh, shirtless, <laughs> shirtless picture where uh, you can see that I'm relatively lean. I'm working on getting leaner. Uh, got, you know, I've gotten a little bit, uh, I've added about five pounds of fat over the past six months or so, so I'm working towards getting back to that. So uh, stay tuned. But uh, what about other uh, fitness-related stats? So, and, and these are my average stats. Uh, so this is for example, starting with body weight. I weigh myself every day in the morning. Uh, and um, so uh, with all of those data, what's my average uh, body weight during the 62-day period that went from my last blood test to this blood test? So uh, my average uh, body weight was 157.6 pounds and I'm 5 foot 7, which gives me a BMI of 24.7 uh, kilograms per meter, which is at the uh, upper end of the uh, lean category. And then my resting heart rate, RHR, is 49 beats per minute. My heart rate variability, HRV, is uh, about 49 milliseconds. Now, for those who've seen my resting heart rate and heart rate variability uh, uh, video, uh, my heart rate variability is actually about 10 milliseconds uh, uh, lower than, it, than it's been at its peak on average. Um, so uh, one reason for that is because of the, of the weight gain that I put on, some of it muscle, some of it fat, over the past six months or so. Um, it, it, you know, being calorie restricted is not easy for me. So I don't, oh, I'm not always successful. I go through periodic swings with a little bit up in weight and then a little bit down in weight. So what supplements am I taking? Uh, so all I take uh, is here and uh, I, I take levothyroxine um, for hypothyroidism. I've taken that for the past 25 years or so since I was diagnosed with it. Vitamin D in the winter, a uh, thousand I use a day oh, and only in the winter, not in the su uh, summer when I get sunlight uh, regularly, daily. And then I take a stack of methylfolate, methyl B12, and B6 to try to keep my homocysteine, which likes to get into the 15 range, which is about two times as high as it should be. And taking this uh, methylfolate, uh, methyl B12, and B6 supplement seems to help reduce that down to less than 10. So what about my average daily dietary intake? Now, for those who are familiar with my videos, I weigh all of my food. I then enter that uh, data into an online nutrition app which I'm not going to say their name, I'm not sponsored, so I'm not going to you know, give, give free shout outs. But if anybody's interested, I'll leave a comment and I'll indicate which one that I use. Um, and then from there, I take all of that data and put it in Excel files in terms of macros and micros and food quantities so that I can track each of those variables against my blood test data and look for correlations between my diet and the blood test and then try to optimize the blood test variables based on changing uh, things in my diet. So the average daily dietary intake is, is what's shown here. And for the two-month period that went from my last blood test until this blood test, my average calorie intake was 
2615 uh, protein intake was 123 grams per day, which is 19% of my total calorie intake. Fat intake was 95 grams per day, which corresponds to 32% of my total calorie intake. Carbs were 335 grams, but which results in 51% of my total calories were from carbohydrates. Now that may seem like a lot, but then uh, I, I I eat uh, about 100 gram, well 100.5 grams of fiber per day, and when that uh, can, when considering that that's uh, counted as carbohydrate, we can subtract the fiber from the carbs to result in a net carb intake of 200 and, uh, th about 235 grams, which my percentage of carbohydrate after subtracting fiber is about 36 percent uh, carbs. And then also my average cholesterol intake daily, uh, uh, dietary cholesterol intake is about 178 milligrams per day. And that'll become more uh, interesting slash important in uh, the next uh, upcoming slides. So let's take a little bit look, uh, deeper look at my CRP values uh, because I want to focus on those changes since uh, that's one of the greatest changes that I've been able to make over the past uh, uh, few blood tests. Uh, granted, there are other improvements for lymphocyte percentage and white blood cells, but those will be topics for another video. So we can see that in 2020, the six uh, measurements for C-reactive protein, I range from relatively lower to 0.3 to as high as 1.01. And uh, over the past three blood tests, I've been able to reduce that back down to the 0.27 on, on this blood test, uh, which is uh, about half of what my average 2020, 2020 value was. Now, when considering that C-reactive protein increases during aging and higher levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, and if you're interested in that data, click on the link in the right corner. I've made a, I made a video about that before. Uh, so it's important to keep it low and to make sure it stays low over the duration of you know, the decades to come. So which variables are impacting CRP? What do I think is, uh, is what's impacting it so that I'm able to keep it at a relatively low level? And I think dietary cholesterol may be uh, a key player in the story. So let's have a look at that data. So first, this is data for uh, blood cholesterol. So total cholesterol is correlated with lower CRP. So we have CRP on the y-axis and then my blood levels of total cholesterol on the x-axis. And what we can see is that the higher my total cholesterol uh, in blood, the lower my levels of CRP. And that's a significant correlation. Uh, but I should mention that's within the range, my range of 133 to 185. And, and, you know, others may have different data from me, but I think we can all replicate the approach to try to identify the best food pattern that optimizes our, bi our biomarkers with the goal of uh, minimizing disease risk and maximizing longevity. So the obvious question when considering this association between my blood cholesterol levels with C-reactive protein is which dietary variables can impact total cholesterol. If I can use diet to increase cholesterol, then potentially I can reduce CRP. And as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, dietary cholesterol may be involved in this process. So a higher dietary cholesterol intake is correlated with higher TC. And this, again, is in my data. And we can see that here. So the higher my average dietary cholesterol intake is, the higher my blood levels of cholesterol are. And that, that again, is a significant correlation as, as seen by the uh, uh, p-value. So then the obvious question is, is dietary cholesterol correlated with CRP? Is there a direct effect there or potential direct effect there? And interestingly, dietary cholesterol is not significantly correlated with CRP. So this suggests to me that this is maybe an indirect effect where more dietary cholesterol, more total cholesterol, and then for whatever reason, through whatever mechanism, higher levels of blood cholesterol are involved in mechanisms that are reducing CRP. Now, total cholesterol, TC, equals the sum of HDL plus LDL and VLDL. So which of these are correlated with C-reactive protein? So I've got those correlations here, and uh, we can see that VLDL is not correlated with CRP. The p-value is higher than 0.05. LDL is relatively close to significance with a p-value of 0 0.1, uh, 0.1. But then HDL, a higher HDL, is inversely correlated with C-reactive protein. So higher HDL is correlated with lower C-reactive protein. And based on the p-value, that's a significant correlation. So we can see that here visually. The higher my HDL, the lower the, the CRP. So then the obvious question is, okay, how can I impact HDL? How can I use my diet to optimize HDL? And then the next obvious question is when considering that dietary cholesterol is uh, correlated with my total blood uh, levels of blood cholesterol, is dietary cholesterol uh, impacting HDL? And uh, based on the data, no. Uh, dietary cholesterol is not significantly correlated with HDL, uh, at least based on uh, the stats here. So what is correlated with HDL? So in my data, in looking at all of the macros and micros, uh, a higher sodium intake and a lower fructose intake, total fructose, 
uh, including uh, the amount that comes from sucrose. Sucrose is half fructose and glucose. So sucrose divided by two equals uh, fructose, and then adding that to the uh, uh, pure fruit fructose that would be in my diet. So higher sodium but lower fructose are individually correlated with uh, HDL. So first on the left, we can see that the higher my salt intake, and this is within the range of 1,400, about 1,400 uh, milligrams of salt per day to about 26, uh, 25, 2,600 milligrams per day. The higher my salt intake is correlated with uh, a higher HDL. Uh, and then conversely, the higher my total fructose intake, the lower my HDL. So with that in mind, I try to keep my fructose intake closer to the 70 to 80 gram or less if I can. I mean, I, I, I love eating fruit. I have a sweet tooth. Uh, it's, it's really tough for me to try to get it lower than that, but I, I try because as you can see on the graph, I've got um, average daily fructose intakes of more than 110 grams per day on average. Uh, so uh, getting it to 70 to 80 around there is, a, is actually a win for me. All right, and it, whereas univariate correlations are interesting, I combine those two and put them in a model to see how much of the variability in HDL that, that uh, a multivariate model that included fructose and sodium uh, could explain. And we can see here, based on the adjusted R squared, that 40% of the variability in HDL can be explained by uh, the, ver uh, the, the data for sodium and fructose. So uh, now that also begs the question, what's the other 60% that can explain the variability uh, for HDL? So uh, I'll look further, in, further, in, further into that and stay tuned uh, in later videos for that data. So then the next obvious question is, if sodium and fructose are impacting HDL, are they directly impacting C-reactive protein, or can they? Or are they correlated with changes in CRP? So uh, first, a higher sodium intake is correlated with a lower CRP. And this is uh, uh, statistically significant, sorry, uh, with a p-value of 0.05. And again, this is within the range of about 1,500 to 2,500 milligrams of salt per day. Now, I'm, uh, for my next blood test, I'm going to experiment with a little bit higher, maybe somewhere in the 2,700 uh, milligrams of sodium per, uh, per day. I don't want to go too high because it could potentially uh, increase my blood pressure, and I've noticed some correlations between higher creatinine and higher glucose, which is going in the wrong direction. So trying to find the amount of salt that could potentially optimize HDL while not affecting the other biomarkers um, is, is the goal. Now, interestingly, my average daily fructose intake was not correlated with CRP. So with all of these data in mind for the next blood test, will increasing dietary cholesterol uh, and sodium, but limiting fructose, uh, further reduce CRP while increasing HDL? And I should mention too, when, I, when I'm talking about an increase for dietary cholesterol, I'll probably uh, put this in another video, but there's data that uh, uh, dietary cholesterol intakes up to uh, 250 milligrams per day are associated with lowest risk of, of death for all, ca uh, all causes, so lowest all-cause mortality risk. Going higher than 250 milligrams per day of dietary cholesterol is associated with a higher all-cause mortality risk. If you remember from the earlier slide, my average uh, um, uh, daily dietary uh, cholesterol intake was 178 milligrams per day. So I'm going to experiment getting uh, closer to about 250, see if that raises my uh, total cholesterol, potentially LDL, uh, and uh, increase my salt a little bit to try to get the HDL up. And let's see if all of all those changes bring my C-reactive protein further down. I've had values as low as 0.2 milligrams per liter, so it's, it's possible to get it lower than where it is at 0.27. All right, if you made it to the end, thanks a lot. Um, you can find me lots of places online. Have a, have a great day.